family of the Texas Conference, we're so happy that you could join us for this time together. This is a new program called Texas Corner. The purpose of it is to allow the members of the Texas Conference to get to know those who work here in the Texas Conference office in a more personal fashion. And so we're so happy to initiate, to uh, uh, begin this program. Our first guest is our distinguished conference secretary, Elder David Montoya. So happy that you could be with us today, and thank you for doing this, David. Thank you for the invitation, for the privilege and opportunity to be here with you and uh, just converse and uh, talk about um, anything that will help our folks get to know us better. Yes, and uh, let's, let's begin with this question. Tell us a little bit about where you were born, where you grew up, and a little bit of your journey early on in life. Sure. Well, um, I was born in Othello, Washington, mm -hmm. a small farming community mm -hmm. in the southeast part of Washington State. Mm -hmm. um, every year, our, our family would, would make the trek up there from Texas um, and spend eight months of the year working in agriculture from um, the month of um, March all the way through October. Mm -hmm. And then the other four months, we would spend in Eagle Pass, Texas, uh, you know, uh, November through February. So that was our, our routine to go up hmm. there and work and uh, also go to school. And that happened up to about when I was 15 years old. And at that time, the, um, the work, the labor that was done by the human hand was uh, replaced by machinery, uh, implementation of machinery. So that just uh, eliminated that opportunity to work. So we just stayed in Eagle Pass, Texas. And that's where I finished high school. And uh, you know, I learned a lot through that experience. It was uh, hard work, but uh, very uh, educational. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that. I'm always interested in the backgrounds of, of people, and here in the Texas Conference is so diverse, so mm -hmm. rich, and uh, we praise God for that. One of the things that we feel is the strength of the conference. So tell us a little bit about your background, the cultures that kind of formed who you are today. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure, sure. Well, I am second-generation Hispanic, mm -hmm. uh, Mexican American. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents from Mexico, yeah. and like I said, since I was born in Othello, Washington, you know, that makes yeah. me a U.S. citizen. Yeah. So um, going to school, of course, I learned the English language, mm -hmm. became bilingual, bicultural, mm -hmm. and uh, living in Eagle Pass, Texas, which is a border town, you know, exposed to to Mexico, uh, our heritage, and uh, learning just the different customs. Of, uh, of, of Mexican culture. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, kind of like living in two worlds. Yeah. You know, we had the, the, the American U.S. culture, uh, school, uh, TV, books, all mm -hmm. of that, you know, that culture, that language, that mindset. And then, you know, we had the, the Mexican culture, the other world. Right. So um, at times I would uh, gravitate from one world <laughs> to the other. And uh, someone once asked me, so, um, when, when you're thinking, do you think in English or Spanish? I said, man, that's a good question. Um, I think English, yeah. English, I think English, language. Um, but of course, you know, I can be able to function in both worlds. Mm -hmm. So uh, growing up um, in, in those two worlds, those two cultures, help, uh, help me become who I am. And just uh, learning from both, appreciating both what they had to offer, and just yeah. uh, becoming well-rounded yeah, as, a, as a person. Yeah, that's interesting, um, that uh, dual uh, culture that uh, made you who, who you are today, and uh, we're just praising God as we hear each one of these stories. It's going to be interesting to see how God has led each one in mm -hmm. their lives. And Amen. We certainly see that. Um, we're trying to give our listeners a um, and our viewers a snapshot of uh, who our people are here in the office. And so we appreciate you sharing that background. Let me ask you this. Um, do you have a favorite childhood memory that sticks out in your mind? Hmm. Uh, there's several, but I would think the one that stands out among the others um, took place again in Othello, Washington. Mm -hmm. You know, we spent most of our time there during the year. Um, mm -hmm. So I remember one Sunday, it, it was a summer, School was out, and um, we, we went to the lake, uh, Scutney Springs Lake. I still remember the name. It yeah. was a few miles outside of Othello. And uh, on that occasion, you know, my, uh, I had several aunts and uncles and cousins that gathered on that uh, time, that um, occasion. 
And I remember, you know, the sun was shining, the, the weather was perfect. And, you know, we donned on our bathing suits. Mm. And, you know, the lake was there. We, we'd go swimming for a while. We'd get hungry, come out. And, of course, the, the adults had prepared a banquet there at the picnic table. And we'd eat. I still remember the watermelon. And I, I think that the reason it stands out was because as, as an early teen, that's about the time it took place, mm -hmm. I had no worries, yeah. no concerns, no cares in the world. You know, school was out, yeah. so I didn't have to go to school the next day. And just, just spending time with, with my cousins, uh, with my aunts and uncles, uh, just the fellowship that took place. Mm. Just, it was such a good feeling, such a happy moment that uh, I look back on that and uh, reminisce. And I still feel the, the warm mm. uh, experience of that time. So. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. You know, um, just for the viewer's sake, um, when they see David Montoya, they see this very serious, stately individual that's... Uh, um, very, very uh, serene in, in his demeanor. But uh, just to share a little bit behind the scenes, uh, Elder Montoya can cut up with the best of them. And we have a lot of fun here in the office, um, joking and humor aside um, that you exhibit. And just want to say thank you mm. for bringing that uh, to, the, to the table as well. Mm. Something that the uh, members don't always see, but just to uh, be able to share with them how um, how much of a joy you are to work with. I think that's important. Thank Let you. me ask you a little bit about your immediate family. What can you tell us about them? Sure. Well, um, in our home, of course, it's uh, my wife, mm -hmm. uh, Mary Ann, mm -hmm. uh, Maria Anna, originally. Yeah. Uh, because, but again, uh, living in two worlds, um, yes. that name was more uh, appropriate yes. in, in the English culture. So um, we've been married in, in March 22nd. It'll be 35 years. Wow. Next month, we'll be ce celebrating our 35th anniversary. Hmm. And uh, we have two kids, yes. uh, Veronica, mm -hmm. who's married, and mm -hmm. they have two children, mm -hmm. and Michael, who's also married and have three kids. Mm -hmm. So um, my wife, you know, super wife, uh, super mom, and now a super grandma. Yes. Uh, she loves the kids, and they love her. And uh, the kids, you know, fantastic you know, hardworking, mm -hmm. uh, went to school and uh, supported the family. We all pulled together. Mm. But, um, you know, as we moved from place to place uh, as a pastor on mm -hmm. the field, you know, it was uh, neat to see how resilient the kids were, you know, how they adapted. Mm -hmm. It wasn't always easy, mm. but um, they, they did good. They did mm -hmm. good. And, and, you know, it was always great to come home after work and uh, just find the family there, and we'd gather and just chat about the day's activities. And, you know, our home was a sanctuary, mm -hmm. you know, a place that we could come to and just relax and just, uh, um, just chill mm -hmm. and uh, get ready for the next day. Mm. So, um, you know, it's been a blessing to, to be a husband and a father and now a grandfather. Mm -hmm. And our kids, they're just down the road about two hours from Alvarado. Mm. So we get to see them on a regular basis. We try to anyway when we're going down for a meeting somewhere in the south. Yes. We stop by there and, and see them, and, and they come up and, and see us. Mm. So we value family. We value family time. And I've always said that after God, the most important relationships we have uh, are with family Absolutely. And, and loved ones. So Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, again, for the sake of our viewers, um, Ella Montoya is a fantastic spiritual leader here in the conference, but um, it's also inspirational to us who know him to see his dedication to his family, um, to his wife, um, their beautiful relationship, and to his kids. You want to see his face light up, just have him talk about his kids and his grandkids, and that's very evident in his life and uh, very inspirational for all of us. Yeah. Um if you could describe your life journey in a few words, um, how God has brought you um, and matured you and, and shaped you mm. spiritually, um, in, in just a few words, what would you say? Hmm. Well, um, I, I'd like to begin by saying that because I didn't grow up in a Seventh-day Adventist Christian home, mm -hmm. uh, as a young person, there was always that void, that, mm -hmm. that emptiness in my life. Mm -hmm. And once I had the privilege of, of meeting Christ, mm -hmm. um, I, I realized that, you know, there is meaning, there is purpose yeah. uh, in life. And um, from then on, I realized that the, the greatest, the highest uh, relationship that a human being can have mm -hmm. is, is with his God. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So um, over time, uh, as a Christian and, and as a pastor, and still now working here in the office, uh, to me, the most important aspect uh, of my life is that relationship with God. Mm. You know, it, uh, I take it seriously, and it's a joy every morning to wake up early and spend that quiet time with God. And I've seen how He's uh, transformed me as a person. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I would never in a million years dream when I was a young person that I would be a pastor, I'd be mm. a Christian, and uh, working here uh, as one of the officers here in the conference office. So um, I value that relationship with God and, and spending time with Him in, in prayer and His Word and service has uh, formed me, has transformed me, mm-hmm. and has shaped me to the person who I am today. Very good, very good. Now, your role and your work here in the Texas Conference is, uh, the title is Conference Secretary. I know a lot of members, especially new members, struggle with that mm. to understand what, what is that. Is that a secretary who takes dictation and types on a typewriter? Uh, what is your role and what is uh, the essence of your work as Conference Executive Secretary? Mm. Mm-hmm. Well, um, Conference Secretary, I am one of the three executive officers. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I work together uh, with the, the team and, and the others in the office mm-hmm. to make sure that the work of God is moving forward here in the Texas Conference. And um, <clears throat> one of my responsibilities is to uh, oversee and to coordinate the personnel committee. Mm-hmm. As the title says, you know, we deal with personnel, uh, those coming in uh, mm-hmm. to join the team and mm-hmm. those transitioning out perhaps to another conference or another mm-hmm. ministry. And I also um, uh, coordinate and oversee the um, Constitution and Bylaws Committee. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's necessary to make some changes or amendments Mm -hmm. to the Constitution just so that, you know, everything flows well Mm -hmm. and smoothly here in the conference office. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I have the privilege to work with other departments. I work with the Human Resource Department. I work with Ministerial Department. I work with um, Evangelism Department and Church Planting just making sure that uh, they have the resources um, needed to, to move forward and, and be successful. Mm-hmm. Along with me in Conference Secretary, I also help out in the Public Affairs and Religious Liberty Department. Mm-hmm. So basically there we're helping church members that have Sabbath observant issues there in uh, school or, or their employment to just uh, have that support and make sure that uh, their administrators or, or their employers are respecting um, their Sabbath uh, observance, uh, their Sabbath requests mm-hmm. to, to practice their faith and worship God, God on the Sabbath. So. Yeah, yeah, well, that's quite a bit. <laughs> that's a large area to cover, and uh, there were some things you didn't mention. Right. You just mentioned the main things, but uh, you're always busy, and your desk is always full, <laughs> and uh, your phone is always busy, your emails are always flowing, so we appreciate so much all of that um, work that you do to keep Amen. the conference solid administratively. Mm. Now, you've been the conference secretary for about 19 months. Before that, you were one of the few that has started your ministry in Texas and been here the whole time. How many years were you a pastor here in the Texas conference? Well, uh, I graduated from Swau um, in 1990. Mm-hmm. And that's when I came on to be a pastor here in Texas. Mm-hmm. And then after a year of working in the field, I was sent to a seminary mm-hmm. over in Andrews University mm-hmm. and spent there about two years and a half. Mm. So um, in the field, actually working as a pastor, I would calculate about 27 years mm-hmm. uh, serving actively in a church district. And then mm-hmm. in 2019, um, I came on board here as a mm-hmm. conference secretary. Amen. So it's... Uh, a long, rich heritage of pastoring, and that's one of the things, for our viewers' sake, that makes you a great fit for what you're doing over personnel, over uh, the administrative part of the conference, because having served so long mm. with distinction as a pastor in the field, you know very well what pastors go through in the field. You've experienced that wealth of experience. You're able to share with them, to counsel them, and to help them as they make decisions. And so that's just amazing how God hmm. chooses just the right person in the right fit to, to keep his work moving along. Amen. This, Amen. this probably is a question you might want to plead, plead the fifth to, but um, if there was one thing you could change and do over in your life experience, what would you, what would you point hmm. to there? 
if I could go back and do something different or change, you know, it was when I was a teenager that I started sensing uh, an emptiness, a void that I mentioned mm. previously. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what, what was happening in me. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't say anything to anyone, mm -hmm. um, not wanting that folks think I'm weird or different, yeah. you know. Um, so I kept it to myself mm. and didn't ask anybody if they were experiencing that. So um, I think that if I could go back, um, I would seek answers. Uh, I would seek someone's help, mm -hmm. um, asking, you know, what is this about? Of course, later on, I realized that that emptiness, that, that, that void was for God. Mm -hmm. You know, I was hungry for God and realizing that the things of the world could not satisfy that, that need, that crave for, for a relationship yeah. with God. So if I could go back, I would seek help. I would ask. I would explore, you know, what it was I was experiencing. And I believe that I would have known Jesus sooner. I would have had started that relationship with him, and as, re as a result, I would have that peace, that hope that I was longing for so much, mm -hmm. but didn't have a, as a young person. And of course, out of that, you know, relationship would flow that confidence, that trust, mm -hmm. that knowing that God had a plan for me, has a plan for me, mm -hmm. and had a purpose for me. Something that as a teenager, as a young person, as a child and teenager, I didn't experience. Mm -hmm. So if I could go back, I would just be more proactive mm -hmm. in finding out what, what mm -hmm. is taking place in my heart. Why do I feel the way I do? Mm -hmm. And as a result, I would have known him sooner. Mm. Wow. Um, you know, pr probably one of the things I should share with our viewers is um, um, because you get to know someone when you work with them day after day, and our viewers just see us from time to time mm -hmm. sporadically, mm -hmm. and so they don't have the luxury of of knowing us personally and uh, one of the things that I learned early on about you when you came to the office to work was your deep sense of spirituality and mm -hmm. your relationship with God and I just wanted to share quickly with the viewers that early on when Pastor Montoya came there was one day when we had someone who had come to the conference office and they were sitting out in the lobby and they were pretty upset mm -hmm. um, irate <laughs> would be the best way to describe it and um, I, I said, in my physical, spiritual weakness, I said to Elder Montoya, I'm not going to deal with that person. I'm not going out there to talk to them. But Elder Montoya, in my office, he came to me and he, he said, Carlos, you, we need to pray and we need to go out there and we need to talk to this individual. And I didn't want to, but um, God spoke to me through you that day mm -hmm. and I could sense the Holy Spirit appealing to me through you and that pastoral heart that deep sense of spirituality led me to say, yes, let's, I, I took a deep breath and I said, okay, let's go out and uh, let's talk to this individual. And it turned out well. Amen. The Holy Spirit intervened. Praise God. But I just wanted to share with the viewers how that deep sense of spirituality, that being led by the Holy Spirit that you exhibit has been a great blessing mm. to this office, to me personally, and to the field as you do your work on a day-to-day -day basis. Amen, amen. Let me ask you this. If you could change one thing about the Seventh-day Adventist Church to make it better, what would that be? Hmm. Well, I'm proud of, of our church. Yeah. I'm proud of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Again, mm -hmm. I consider it a privilege to be a Seventh-day Adventist member mm -hmm. and now a, a pastor and now an officer here in the conference office. So I would find it very, very difficult to, to state what I could improve on, but perhaps what comes to mind would be to remind our, our church members worldwide that um, they too have the privilege and the responsibility mm -hmm. of fulfilling the, the Great Commission. Uh, I think mm -hmm. in some minds, perhaps they think, well, you know, that's what pastors get paid for, right. that's why educators get paid for, that's why uh, the office personnel get paid for, you know, mm -hmm. to do the work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that if, if that is the case, there's just a few and far in between that, that think like that. But uh, I think many take it to heart. Mm -hmm. You know, they do their um, ministry or, or, or their, um, their work at church and the community after doing, you know, their, their career during the right. day, during the week. So right. they're actively serving God. But I think uh, there's still a few uh, or maybe more than few that um, need to believe that, mm -hmm. that God has called them to ministry as well. 
God has given them spiritual gifts, uh, talents, mm -hmm. that uh, by exercising, mm -hmm. you know, those talents, we are hastening the second coming of Jesus. Absolutely. So if I could change something, it would basically be to remind our folks, hey, you too have been called by God mm -hmm. to serve mm -hmm. Him, to serve His kingdom, mm -hmm. and to prepare people for the second coming of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. What would you say, I, I know that, you know, you've only been here 19 months in this current role, that God has called you to as conference secretary, as a chief administrative officer of the conference. What would you say is the most gratifying and rewarding part of the work that you've done in, in your perception thus far? Mm -hmm. Well, as a pastor, I always felt fulfilled, you know, helping people, you know, preaching God's word, giving Bible studies, doing pastoral visits, mm -hmm. and just helping people in practical uh, issues. So that was always fulfilling. And uh, it's, it's uh, interesting that being an introvert that I am, shy and timid by mm -hmm. nature, mm -hmm. um, that I would find, you know, being up front speaking, yeah. uh, I would find fulfilling. Because I remember in school, um, it was very hard for me to get up front when we had to do an oral book report or mm -hmm. some type of uh, presentation. Um, it was just very difficult. But I learned early on, and you alluded to that uh, about humor, I learned early on that if I can be funny and make people laugh, that would put me at ease. Mm -hmm. So I could go up front and speak to my classmates. But uh, as a preacher, being up front and, and just seeing, as you said earlier, the light come on in, in people's minds when, when they get God's truth. Yeah. And afterwards, you know, say, hey, that was for me. I found, you know, hope in, in that and encouragement in, in your message. So being here in the conference office, uh, what I find uh, as a blessing is that uh, whereas before I was limited to a church district of two or three or four churches, mm -hmm. and, and I you know, did my work there mm -hmm. uh, with the community, here in the conference office, the beauty of it, uh, among many things, is to uh, speak with people on the phone or via email or text, people that I wouldn't have met or worked with if I was still in the church district. So here I get to see uh, the broader view, the, the big picture of the Texas conference, the God's work here in the Texas conference, and just to, to meet people, uh, to work with them, to serve them. Like I said, during the week, you know, we use all these mediums to, to contact people and reach people. And on the weekends, we're out there preaching or giving a seminar or having a meeting of some sort. And, and I, I love that. Yeah. I, I love that there's that balance. You know, we do administrative work here. Mm -hmm. And then at one moment, we're out there sometimes during the week or the weekends uh, meeting people that, again, I, I wouldn't have met. Not too yeah. long ago, I was uh, in one of the churches up in the Dallas area, and uh, the pastor invited me to do a seminar mm. in the afternoon, a leadership seminar. And before we, we went up to the sanctuary and started the seminar, he asked me, um, you've been here before, right, pastor? I said, no, this is the first time. Mm. And he was surprised. He goes, this is your first time? I said, yes. You know, again, I was a pastor in the field, so I stayed where I was assigned. Um, and now here, I said, you know, you invited me. I'm going to meet these fine folks and yeah. teach them a little bit about leadership and afterwards fellowship a little bit. So I find that what's gratifying, I find that fulfilling um, meeting people and, and listening to their journey, mm -hmm. how God brought them out of darkness to the light and to hope and, and uh, a mm -hmm. future. That so. is great. That is great. Now, one of the things that um, uh, most, most of the viewers won't know uh, about you is your passion for health, and physical fitness, and um, it, that's also an aspect of who you are that's very inspiring to the rest of us. Um, we wish that we could be more inspired to, to do some of the things that you're doing, but um, tell us a little bit about your, um, your passion and your commitment to physical fitness, to having a correct diet, to being the best person that you can be physically. Mm -hmm. I know that you've even helped some of our pastors and others with um, coaching a little bit, you know, with physical fitness. Um, how did you get into that, and why is that so important? Hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, I remember uh, as a child in school, I was either the shortest mm -hmm. or one of the shortest um, students mm -hmm. in, in a classroom. And, you know, now and then you get picked on, yeah. you know, the playground bully kind of yeah. thing. So I would always wish, I wish I was taller. I wish I was stronger. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember as I grew up and became uh, maybe, I was maybe in fourth or fifth grade, my dad, uh, with limited knowledge about 
you know, exercise and um, um, nutrition, he said, hey, if you eat more, you'll grow. I said, oh, why? That's the answer. That's the solution. I'll mm -hmm. eat more. So I started eating more, and then uh, I did grow, but instead of growing up, I grow, grew <laughs> to the sides. Um, and so I got heavier, and that wasn't, you know, what I was longing for. Right. And I remember one, I think it was in eighth grade, it was in junior high, and we were in PE class, and the teacher said, all right, you know, it's the beginning of the school year, we're going to do a physical test, um, and we're, you're going to run the 1,500-meter run. Mm -hmm. And what's that? You know, well, you're going to run uh, this, this uh, section here of, of the field, you're going to run in laps, and then I'm going to time you. So, you know, we had our shorts, our T-shirts, our sneakers, and uh, we all got up to the starting line, and he said, go. And we started running. Of course, the, the leaner ones, the faster ones were up ahead, and us who weren't as lean stayed behind. And I struggled to finish that 1,500-meter run. I really struggled. If I wasn't the last one, I was like the second to the last. Mm. And that really, you know, struck me. I'm like, wow, I'm, I'm at, the, at the end. And that's okay to finish at the end, it's no matter, but the fact that I had to labor to finish the run. So uh, fast forward that summer, I decided that next year, school year, when that time came around to run, I was going to be ready. So during the summer, I started on my own just jogging. I hated to run. I hated to wow. jog. But the impact of, of struggling so much because my extra weight was holding me back, um, I determined that I was going to start practicing, mm. and lo and behold, I, I became faster. I mm. was building my endurance, my stamina, and of course I lost weight, although that wasn't the intention at first, but sure. I saw how much lighter I was. So the next time we had to do the run, it was a whole lot easier. And so from then on, I, I fell in love with running, and then you know I added some push-ups and some pull-ups and some dumbbell and barbell, and as I got older, you know, I, f I saw the benefits of that. Mm. You know, I could do more work with mm. less effort, mm. and I could last longer doing that. And as a pastor, because of the stress that's involved mm -hmm. in serving, mm -hmm. it's a beautiful work, but there is stress involved and pressure. I realized that by keeping on the running practice, mm. um, uh, the exercising, calisthenics, helped me manage stress, helped mm. me cope with stress mm -hmm. a whole lot better. Mm -hmm. And I even found out that when I didn't run on a regular basis, I would tend to get discouraged a whole lot easier, almost, you know, leaning toward depression. And I realized that the uh, endorphins that we mm -hmm. produce when we're exercising mm -hmm. was just what I needed uh, mm -hmm. to be successful as a pastor. So right. over the years, you know, I've added new elements to, to my routine. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought that once I got here, that it would be challenging because of the schedule. Yeah. But uh, I realized that, you know, you make time for God, eat family, and exercise, and of course, the rest of the day flows a whole lot better nice. uh, working here. Uh, even though we're not lifting anything heavy here, right. but we do right. have a lot of work, which mm -hmm. is mental. Um, but I realized that um, to better serve God and our conference mm -hmm. uh, by being physically fit, I can, I can do that. Very good. Very good. We just have about 30 seconds left. Um, I want to ask you, how would you like to be remembered, you know, when your time on earth is over? How would you like for people to remember Elder David Montoya? I would say David Montoya was just an ordinary person mm. who knew, loved, and served an extraordinary God mm. and joined him doing an extraordinary work here on earth and preparing people for Jesus' second return. Amen. Amen. Well said. Thank you, uh, David, for joining us and for uh, giving us this look into your life and this insight into your life. May the Lord continue to richly bless you as you serve the people of the Texas Conference and his people. And uh, may he give you and Mary, your kids and your grandkids, great joy as you serve him. Amen. Viewers, we just want to say uh, we look forward to our next time together with Texas Corner. This is going to be fantastic as you get to know the people of the Texas Conference here in the Texas Conference office a little bit better. The next time we'll be talking with someone who loves numbers. I know we have a lot of accountants and business people out there uh, among our membership. Uh, we're going to be talking with someone who just loves numbers. Uh, when I look at numbers, my eyes roll back <laughs> into the back of my head. But 
this individual you'll find loves numbers and has a passion for that. God bless you. We'll talk with you soon. And remember to keep your eyes focused on Jesus Christ. Amen.